Hey, everybody, we're here alive and thrive in Toronto, home of Blue Jays, Raptors, Maple Leafs, and Canadian psychic Robert Lindsay Milne. And that's me. Welcome to my side of the crystal ball. We have an, an illuminating show tonight. My guest, Jeff Osner, has a very interesting background. Um, he's an author of many, many books. But before we get into that, um, he also is a musician, grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, he earned his master's degree in, in social work from the University of Georgia. Jeff practiced psychotherapy, music therapy, clinical hip hypnotherapy, massage therapy for over 30 years before he retired. Currently, with his love for the earth, coupled with a rich mix of experience of attunement to nature, Jeff seeks to support and share pioneering regenerative approaches to our climate crisis and to affirm our largely unexplored capacities to connect with and directly benefit natural environments. And tonight on our show, he's offering his uh, latest free book, his latest book um, for no charge, Attunements for the Earth, covering areas of being poetic, musical, photographic, antecedental, climatic, uh, institutional, scientific, and spiritual uh, levels all in the book. And it's free, complimentary, because you're on with us. Before I get started with our exciting show tonight, I have a couple of requests. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We've been doing really well over the past year and a half. In fact, I am very happy to announce um, we're now in the top 10% most listened to uh, podcast in a paranormal segment on several different medias around the world. And it's all because of your commitment and, and uh, loyalty to us. It also has a lot to do with uh, light media and and uh, Michelle and Kayla and the family uh, doing a great job producing this show. We are in the top 10. How wonderful. Thank you for being uh, so supportive. Um, now I have, I have another request though. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe to our channel because Every time you subscribe, we get a little bit higher in the ratings. And, and the higher in the ratings, the more opportunity I'm going to be able to have or we're going to be able to have to produce my side of the crystal ball. You can also find us on Apple, Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, Paranormal UK, and pretty much anywhere else that you can find uh, that you listen to your podcast or see it. If you wanted to find me personally, you can find me on my website, www.robertlindsaymilne.com. You can find out about the readings that I do, life coaching, and um, more information about the psychic class that's coming up just after I have my uh, uh, bypass surgery. So before uh, we go off to uh, my side of the crystal ball, I'd like to thank you all for being here and uh, Hope you enjoy the show. We see the world not as how it is, but how we are. And we always see things from our point of view. What's interesting is that we can create or have any point of view that we choose. And I really believe that being happy is a conscious choice. And I also believe the opposite, that being sad also is a conscious choice. We just have to focus on which one or anywhere in between we would like to experience. Thinking about different points of view, how, how we see things, I'm reminded of a story I heard a long, long time ago. It's, uh, I think it's more of a fable. 
But uh, there was this very large shoe company in North America, and they decided that they wanted to expand around the world. So they picked a country in deepest, darkest Africa somewhere, and um, they sent one of their best salespeople over uh, to set up um, some stores. So as the plane landed, and this was in the old days where, you know, they just, you know, they landed right outside the terminal and you came down the stairway and straight into the terminal. So anyway, this hotshot salesman gets, as he's going down the steps, he's looking around and, and he sees all the people and dejectedly, he walks into the terminal, calls head office and uh, collect and says, send me a return ticket nobody wears shoes here well about six months later same company sends another salesperson out and as the plane lands the guy's looking out the window and he gets a big smile on his face and they you know they put the stairway in place he runs down the stairway right across uh into in, in inside the terminal calls the com calls overseas to the company uh collect and says send me a million pairs of shoes, nobody wears them here. Both points of view are correct. There is no right, there is no wrong. We see things from our point of view. I'm going through a really interesting time right now. Well, interesting um, um, and many other things as well. Um, I'm going to be having uh, bypass surgery shortly. And I've been waiting for the operation for several weeks now. I'm two weeks away. Um, I can look at this in many different ways. So, for example, this last couple of years have been some of the most successful times uh, of, of my career, certainly in the last 25 years or more. And I could look at this where, you know, where I'm I, I, I'm booked in advance for appointments. Um, I appear on so many podcasts around the world. My own podcast, my side of the crystal ball is is um, getting such high ratings and such high views. We're in the top 10 percent on on several different networks. And that's just after the, a, a short amount of time. My readings are better. Um, we're just in the process of of having uh, doing uh, my the, the my new psychic class, and I have to take off um, and 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 have bypass surgery. That's what a terrible time for that to happen when everything was was going so good. Why why of all the times could this have to be? You, you know, like wow, I'm so disappointed. Okay. That, that's legitimate, you know, because um, it's true. So now I have another way of looking at it. And the way I'm looking at it is, this couldn't be a better time for this to happen. Um, my side of the crystal ball has really high ratings. We have, we have, my side of the crystal ball um, has really high ratings. Um, I'm booked up in advance for uh, readings, um, uh, and and in fact, several months in advance. It hasn't been like that in years. Um, I am working right up until just before my surgery, doing readings. Thank goodness. Um, I have all of my expenses covered. And as soon as I'm recovered, I'll be able to start back to work and things will be going well uh, again very, very quickly. I'm able to make sure my, my home is safe, my, my, my dogs are safe, and I'm very well cared for. This couldn't have been a better time for it to happen. That's the way I choose to see it. Because I see things from my point of view. And being happy is a conscious choice. And also being sad is a conscious choice. It's up to you. Which way do you want to be? 
Well, I'm going for uh, the most positive way. And that's what Robert has to say. You know, Jeff, I've been looking at your uh, uh, bio and there's so much to talk about, so much to learn from you. Um, and I just want to start off with how does a 20 year old young man, I, I think originally from Kansas City, is that correct? Yes. Yes. How did this 20 year old get to Scotland or find out about Findhorn? How did you find that, that about that? I was at Berlin College um, and was a, um, a sophomore when I found out about a program that would be a, a year exchange at the University of Aberdeen. And I thought that would be a very good thing. Um, my mother's side, I'm Scottish, and I've always heard good stories about that in my, my ancestry. So I did get in to that program. And when I went to the university, I saw on the bulletin board in the student union a notice that there was going to be a talk about the Findhorn community, which, in fact, I hadn't known a thing about. And I went to the talk, and within about a week or two, I had hitchhiked up 70 miles to um, the Moray Firth, um, a sandy area where this community had been established seven years prior um, in 1962. And um, there were only a few Americans uh, who had ever been there. And I, I think I might have been one of about 30 people that came and went from my studies at the university on almost all of my vacations and some weekends. And what I what I found there was an extraordinary community, which still exists to this day, much larger, um, in which the center of the center of the community was both contemplation, uh, connection with the sacred, and a garden. And they brought those two things together um, by attuning to the energies of that area and to the larger energy of of, of the whole. Of reality and they did this dedic in with great dedication for years before we worked in the garden i began to experience this we would quietly hold hands and attune to quietness to peace and allow ourselves to be receptive as possible just like anybody who is interested in receiving impressions or intuitions does but with a sp specific intention to uh to be deeply in touch with the place, with what we thought of as the nature spirits there. Some people might prefer to think of them as energies um, rather than entities. But the fact is that the garden was growing um, in a phenomenal way on this rather sandy soil. How big a place is it? It's kind of small. Um, I don't remember the actual acreage and it has expanded some but it's kind of small. It's it's near a near a beach. Um, it actually was formed on a, <laughs> on the site of a, a what they call a caravan park, what we call a trailer park, which now they pretty much uh, have taken um, for their own. And um, now I suppose there must be over two hundred people there. I, I'm what not. What does it look like? You know, kind of modest buildings, except for a few really grand um, community buildings. Uh, the Universal Hall, which has been rebuilt after a fire, <laughs> and other places that they acquired not too far away that were already built, um, places for a university that they established. Um, so, but mostly rather modest, um, modest dwellings. Um, and a lot of garden space. And that that feeling of ambience there between ourselves and nature was a powerful experience for me. Um, I think I'd experienced it before with people, but never in a collective way where there are a number of people putting their minds on connecting fruitfully with nature. What happened that made the place kind of famous in the 70s was that um, we have cooperative extension agents here that come and do things like test the soil. Well, they have that there. And their um, version of that came and checked the soil at the Findhorn community, which was very poor, apparently, based on what was in it. But he found all of the rare trace elements that one might not expect to find 
except in the finest gardens there. Uh, inexplicable, but it drew the interest of people with the British Soil Association and others who I actually met when they came up to uh, to view the place, and it drew the uh, attention of some Americans and others who came and began to write articles when, about it. When yeah. you first went there, sure. did you have any idea where you were going? Or, or or that sacred land, did you have any idea or sense this was going to happen? I did, because that talk um, that I heard at the university made it clear that this was a spiritual community and that they were trying to do something positive in relation, in a, in deep relationship with nature. And I've, I've always been interested in um, in that since I, I, I experienced some, some spiritual some psychic and spiritual openings in my 17th year that really got me curious, um, not only about who we are, but also how we might live more productively together. So it all worked very nicely for me, and I, I just loved the place. How long did you stay there? Sometimes I'd be there for a week, sometimes for days, and I've been back five times since then. Um, so I don't really know in total, a lot of people I've known have lived there for years. Do you ever want to go and live there? No, um, what I've done here in Northwest Arkansas with my gardens and the people that I'm working with and the visits that I have made to Finthorn, I feel like the, the, the energy of the place is kind of, um, it's kind of been embodied in me somewhat, and I don't feel a need to go there, but I would love to see it again, but it's not its not a need right now. Tell me about your gardens. Well, right now, I need to be careful because the weather is like a darn accordion coming yeah. cold and hot and in yeah. and out, and uh, I've done some early plantings. Um, and just as I learned at Finhorn, my wife and I will sometimes hold hands or or just see the place in light and see it flourishing. And, you know, some people are really, some of your listeners, maybe you, are probably very sensitive to nature spirits or to what we call devas or angelic overlighting presences that that help hold the template, the integrity of plants and trees and places. I'm not always that sensitive, but there's a feeling that I get. Um, and a lot of times on a daily basis, what I experience rather than having a communion with a particular being is an overall sense of great love for the area and for the plants and things like that. And I can feel that as a kind of um, a kind of nutrient yes. to the area. This uh, last spring, I uh, moved to a different part of uh, Toronto, and um, I like to look after lawns and, and gardens. I just and and I've been doing that here, and uh, I noticed one day this this beautiful big tree on the front lawn, and it was hot, and and I just all of a sudden decided to water the tree, and and um, it was at night I did it. And and um, the next morning when I came out, the tree was all strong and, and thriving and I could feel the life in the energy and um, a gratitude from from I felt that energy from the tree. Oh, OK, I'm not I'm not being sounded crazy to you then. I could, you no. know, I felt I'm, like I'm I felt the gratitude. Yeah. From the I tree. Relate. Oh, yes. I so relate. Yeah, and you know, this brings to me a, a very brief poem that I is included in, in the book in the section of poetry with my wife Leslie's photos. And it's about a tree I loved called, um, I called it Oak Angel, and it was behind our house. It goes like, tree at our window, presiding oak, you stand before me, a branching of brown roads, and tell me, my roots cannot fail thirst, for in the earth our life is. Old angel, you were singing in the crush of day as you are now, in the rose church of twilight, but only now I hear. While we sleep, 
you walk the deep world breezes, night's cool hand on the brow of our city. So that tree was my friend. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I get uh, species, you know, that was really, that was really a beautiful poem and, 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 in the, and a really great experience. Um, tell me about your book. Well, tell us about your book. Well, the one you just referred to, or, but you've got different. several. Yes, the one I would like to share and is free for downloading on my website um, in the PDF version. Um, my website being G E O F F O E L S N E R dot com uh, is called Attunements for the Earth. And so I wrote this originally when I was teaching a series of poetry writing classes for the Institute for Poetic Medicine, an organization I've been with for about 10 years that shares poetry and poetry writing in a, with a variety of um, challenged populations of people. We do a lot of poetry therapy and support that. Um, and, uh, and I teach a group called Poetry of Nature, which very much focuses on really sensitivity to nature and and exploring that through the writing of poetry so i brought these uh practices of attunement that i learned at the Fintorn community to this group in a series of 10 monthly letters and it's an attempt to share some of my experiences and teach attunement in a really uh, a friendly congenial easygoing kind of way that doesn't try to foist some particular method on people but quite the opposite uh, my effort is to try to help people find their own existing resources for how do you get in the zone? How do you connect? Where do you feel most sensitive to nature? And that's what I tried to do in the letters. And that gave me kind of an impetus to continue the book. And I, I added another section after the letters of stories of different kinds of experiences, not only of attunement, also stories of times when, like you with a tree, intuition and connection was validated it became very clear um, in other words stories of my own journey in that direction then i wanted to include some poetry and that's where my wife also added photos and and then um to make the book diverse we'll be putting that information up on oh, um at the end of the at the end of the show i don't have this the 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 skills to to do all that stuff and talk with you at the same time. Oh no! And, okay. and you can just go right and see well, my my website and get the book. And it'll it'll be on. We'll, we'll promote that too, of course. Yeah, just to say, um, the fourth section of the book is a scientific study, but I've tried to tried to make some comments that are easily understood. The study itself is such a groundbreaking study, um, bringing together really skilled precognitive remote viewers with atmospheric physicists who are involved in climate change mitigation and understanding wow. climate change and coming up with approaches to 10 different questions these physicists asked. And it's the first such study we know of, Julia Mossbridge and I, um, she's the scientist who wrote it. And then the final, section of the book is is a, a lot of songs and the songs uh because i put the book on ebook and pdf form on the ebook one can go directly to the mp3s to the performances of the songs that my wife and i and friends have done as well as see the lyrics and with the with the pdf form that you'll see on my website those songs are at my website too so um that that's a really diverse book. Frankly, if I got it, somebody sent it to me by email, I think I would say, I'll explore around in this. I'm not sure I want to read the whole thing through from cover to cover. But then I often do that with books. I like to kind of, do you ever do when, that? Um, you don't read them from cover to cover, but you explore. Literacy came very late in life to me. And I didn't learn to read and write until I was um, in my late teens. 
and and it's always oh still God. a yes, it's a challenge still for me today. Um, I have a document that's around here somewhere that that says that I am functionally illiterate. Uh, well, I'm not functionally illiterate anymore, but but um, I, I I I was I was declared that, or you know, uh, so. Um, Okay. Yeah, so so the, yeah so I, I i i watch a lot um and and i observe a lot um and and i learn by my instincts um it's it's just just difficult to to um still read and write though computers changed my life yeah it changed my world of course you know one wonders what kinds of gifts have come uh as wonderful compensations oh believe me um oh. i i i developed all though all my psychic and, and intuition skills um because of my literacy or as a result of or um instead of and and uh isn't that interesting yes i really think about yeah. things like that you know i see that when there's need um real need like in a culture where there's a need for psychic or for um, sure. intuitive information about, say, where the where the hunt will be the most successful, when the drought will be over, when the neighboring tribes are going to attack, where there's some kind of real need for survival or for one's one's life to continue forwards, often intuitive gifts come forward. Yes. Um, you know, like I, I um, looked up the t two words um, that that Michelle in the, your your uh, bio that that Michelle sent um, and and one one was uh, mitigated. And I thought, what would that be? Yeah. And and when I looked it up, I, I found out in reference to uh, climate change. Yes. Mitigation means downplay or minimize. Is that correct? To reduce the effects of climate change would be climate change mitigation. Yes. It um, doesn't, it, we're not talking about a panacea here, but just any degree that we can. Oh, OK. See, I, I interpreted that differently. But so just minimizing a little bit. Just, just even a little one. bit would be it'd be a little bit of mitigation yeah okay thank you for that yeah, sure. um when did um you first become aware of climate change and when did you become frightened by it that's a really good question it seems to me like I was aware of it as I was watching my environment here to some degree, at least 15 years ago. I had read about it before that, but it became, it, it started to come home to me more where then every year there were fewer moths around the porch light and the weather patterns seemed to be more variable. So then I began reading about it. Prior to that, in 1980, my whole interest in the field of environmental activism became very vivid because of the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster. And I began a whole, whole period of, along with being a social worker, kind of on the side, I did a lot of environmental research and different kinds of writing um, with others. And I was part of a, a, a one of many different grassroots groups that was trying to um, to deal with um, faulty nuclear reactors, in particular in Arkansas. So we researched some of the unpublicized malfunctions. So in some ways that was a background to it, but to give you a little, it's gonna sound a little more abstract, but I think my sensitivity to nature might've started with my grandpa and a sense of walking uh, through rural areas with him and seeing ways in which those areas were both preserved and also bulldozed and desecrated at times. And I suppose he was so sensitive to those things. You, we can pick things up from our elders. Certainly can. So you were, yes. Um, 
And how do you affect or can how how can you yeah how can you affect the slowing down of climate change? I, I let me read, let me just read. How can an individual do something about minimizing climate change? What can we do? I know we can start with our own lives in our in our own homes and gardens and follow different advice that allows us to minimize things that pollute the environment. And beyond that, I think everybody is going to be finding their own approach, but hopefully not always alone. Like I've been, I'm part, for example, of several organizations. Um, one is called the Wild Foundation that I've supported, um, and it's promoting wilderness land all over the world through a lot of uh, a lot of work with policymakers and other groups that are also trying to keep as much wilderness as possible, because that keeps the integrity of the planet. Um, uh, in fact, when my book is finally published in printed form, all proceeds will go to the Wild Foundation and uh, the Institute for Poetic Medicine, which sponsored my letters initially. So that's one thing, being involved with other groups, um, groups of people that are like-minded and that you would find interesting um, in a particular area where you really already care deeply about the environment. And maybe, um, maybe this would be more of a, a community group of people. But it's a very good question, and it's the kind of question that I would want to leave open for people to consider since you've asked it. In my case, it has been working with other people. It has been attuning and sending love to the earth, absolutely not knowing the effects of this, but at least having books like Chris Bird's and Tompkins' um, The Secret Life of Plants and The Secret Life of the Soil, in which one learns about experiments in the 60s by people like Cleve Baxter, singing to plants, sending good energy to plants, and noticing the difference between a control group of plants that didn't receive that kind of energy or that kind of lovely music um, and plants that did, that there was a differential in growth that was really you know, significant. The experience at the Fintorn Garden and the connection at Fintorn, I hope I'm not talking too much about myself because you've asked what other well, people can do. Uh, well, oh, you're a good example. Well, but I'll say that the connection at Fintorn put me in touch with some people that are really quite a bit more practical and have their their feet on the ground doing particular kinds of environmental work, like the folks that I just mentioned um, in the group Wild Foundation and uh, several individuals that are doing such extraordinary work that I've decided to take some of my resources and try to help them buy time for them to to write books or um, help uh, an outlay of expense to um, send their books to different influencers and environmental thought leaders. So I've been working on that level too with people that know so much more than I do about climate change and even how awful it is um, as it's accelerating and it's impending kinds of um, kinds of threat. They know so much more and yet they have so much positive energy. And this is the kind of person I want to be involved with. What did remote viewers have to do with your research in climate change? Like, uh, uh, what, did, what, what did they have to do with that? The first thing that happened was um, I went back to Fintorn in 2012. And I asked for some connection um, from a, a guy there who I knew was very knowledgeable um, about who I might contact that would be a really excellent um, remote viewer. And I, I just um, was connected over time, a man named Rupert Sheldrake, who's a British scientist and mystic. They do sometimes come together in one person. Well, told yeah. me about... Uh, an American remote viewer who had worked for our intelligence gathering um, for many years, 17 years, named Joseph McMoneagle. 
And I contacted McMoneagle and asked him if he would work with me. Um, because I'd had this amazing kind of, I would say, one would say either fortuitous or guided experience of being led to an atmospheric physicist who was doing some of the, the most significant work back at that time around 2010, 2012, and on, um, on climate change mitigation. And McMoneagle and I and this gentleman, whose name I do not give because of, unfortunately, people's academic reputations sometimes are, um, are compromised when their colleagues discover that they've been drawing on psychic information. Uh, but we all worked together for several years addressing questions that this gentleman had about his approach to climate change mitigation. After that was over, and this gentleman died, and McMoneagle and I are still friends, but he moved on. I met this woman named Julia Mossbridge a few years later. She's a, a neuroscientist and a parapsychologist, another interesting combination, and she is very intuitive herself. So a visionary. And I proposed to her a study in which we work with remote viewing. Now remote viewing, as your, as your listeners may know, is I would be sitting here and I might have the capacity if I were a good remote viewer to see the I could see your home or yes, I, I, I could yeah. uh, you know so perhaps people know this Julia's particular specialty was um working with a group of precognitive remote viewers meaning that in this case they they did what remote viewers called blind tasking. Hard to believe, but McMoneagle and his, uh, his colleagues and these people didn't, weren't given the questions that they were supposed to answer before they answered them. All kinds of crazy safeguards were instituted to keep them from picking this sort of the questions up telepathically from people that had written them down and putting them in the safe where they were kept, things like that. Remarkable. But basically the idea being, let's let's make this an ironclad experiment here where you know they're either going to be right or they're going to be wrong, or they're going to be suggesting some things through their sketches and their notes of impressions that they receive that we'll put together and look at later on and find some meaning in. And that's the kind of work that Julia and I did with seven remote viewers and these 10 questions that the two climate scientists that we worked with after I worked with this gentleman in McMoneagle um, brought to us. And so that's the study. And what kind um, of results did the remote viewers bring? One of the things that I found the most interesting, it was a particular question um, that led to a series of five independently produced drawings that looked very much like um, ocean diatoms, little microorganisms, yes. but in some way applied to some kind of a, a screen or an invention that might be used to have an impact either on generating um, free energy, generating energy without pollution, or perhaps having a um, a cleansing effect on the ocean. Um, Remote viewers did that? They saw did that? this in a way. They Five of them independently saw, saw something in their drawings, wow. at least to, to Mossbridge and her partner, John Vivanco, who were reviewing these things, were very much, um, very much all similar to them in terms of the kind of thing that they were pointing towards there. So what we're doing is we're waiting for a marine biologist um, with a very progressive vision of, um, of things to come along and look into this material that we've, we've put together and its implications. A lot of different um, pieces of information came to the climate scientists as a result of the remote viewers. I thought that was one of the most Valuable. Another one, I think, uh, uh, I had looked into different different forms of um, geoengineering, really controversial. 
how much do we really know about the planet? How much can we really do if we start messing with the atmosphere or the oceans by way of some of these geoengineering schemes? And the, uh, the intuitives or remote viewers in this study at least, really felt like the future of climate change mitigation was going to be more with organic, biological, regenerative forms of agriculture, of marine um, environment restoration, but not, uh, not artificial additives, um, rather uh, the spread of greater and greater kinds of um, drawing down carbon and new, new initiatives to bring a healthier physical environment. I asked you that question and a few others about the remote viewing for, for a specific reason. When I first started my career, I was 15 and a half, and I started working at a tea room. And it's how I got off the street. I was homeless at the time. And when I was 15, I started as doing readings. And I've done this for 58 years. And what I have seen in my life, the change in my uh, calling, um, it's breathtaking. I get choked up to see what our people have done, um, how far we've grown and evolved and been a part of. It's it's breathtaking. And, and I've been involved with, in some of those and helping find uh, a cure to a, a disease that 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 uh, there was no cure for. Um, oh, oh, um, wonderful! And I've I've um, I've toured the world, appearing on radio and TV shows. And uh, my way of doing uh, remote viewing in the 1970s, a person phones into the station. I, I say, you know, ask them what's your name, where you're calling from. They say, I, my name is Mary. I'm calling from such and such a place. Phones were attached to the walls in those days. And and I'd say, okay, Mary, you're holding the phone with your, your left hand. Is that right? And she, yes. Okay. And are you at the kitchen table? Yeah. Move your hand over the top. There. Did you burn the table there <laughs> last night? That was oh, what oh I my. was doing uh, in ro remote viewing. Oh, and yes. What, and what you have done and described to me today is unbelievable. Just Glorious. Thank you. And and what oh blessings all around. Thank you. What listen, what you've done in terms of um bringing your intuition to the curing of a disease. That's where I'm at too. I if I could say, I read this book in about 1980 something called yeah. Psychic Archaeology yeah. by Jeffrey Goodman. And certain psychics were telling different archaeologists this. i didn't know about this history but there was a history of them saying okay here's where you dig dig this far down and you'll find artifacts there are examples of this in the book uh i knew about dowsing i knew that you know mm -hmm. either a dowser is right or wrong right yep and i was really interested in this and at that time i was co-writing a book about radiation protection protection from different kinds of ionizing radiation. So I got in touch with this NASA scientist who was one of the psychics that archaeologists had, had worked with. And um, it was the first time I really thought, you know, uh, I asked him a bunch of questions about radiation protection. And it was the first time I really considered that intuition could be applied to, to questions small and large. Yes, for the sake of reducing suffering and in improving our quality of life. And that's been an interest ever since. Um, these skills, talents, gifts, whatever, whatever people want to call them, are, are actually um, basic instincts that, that we mammals have. And and it's not just it's not just humans. It's it's a trait of mammals. It 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 that instinct that intuition is what caused us to be able to make it out of the caves, or or not get eaten up by dinosaurs. Of course, we might not have been around then. But but so it, it's yeah. hmm? 
I so believe that. Yeah. Just that that that, that remaining intuition. So many humans have that something is looking at me. That's exactly probably right. Came, so so what I do you know, in probably my, came from those cave places. <laughs> absolutely. That, that's right. That's yeah. what you notice that the saber toothed tiger is just about to jump on you. That that's that instinct. Oh well, you, right. what I do in my psychic classes, because I, I I see I believe that almost anyone, almost, not a hundred percent, uh can be psychic. And and the first way of being psychic, as I say, become aware of what's obvious just look when you become aware of what's obvious then more becomes obvious and when more becomes obvious then more becomes obvious again until you get to the point that what is obvious to you is not obvious to others and that's the beginning stages of being psychic and learning how to control it and use it and develop it and expand it. That's the first step. I like that. And it reminds me what one of the co-founders of the Fintorn community, a dear person who died at age 100 in 2021, Dorothy McLean used to say, which is don't just uh, close your eyes when you're wanting to attune to that tree or plant. Let your senses take it in richly. Yes. And allow that which is obvious and clear to become right. even clearer to you. And then yes. other capacities may arise. And uh, and one of the and and what what I'm you know what I also tell people is um also being psychic is uh pay attention to your um uh, um so your senses. Um we have five general senses, touch, taste, smell, see, hear. When those five senses are working together, you then have a sixth sense. That's called extrasensory perception, which makes you become more aware again. Mm -hmm. And then, and then now that they're the basics. And um, I can take a group of people, put them in a, a people that were interested, take a group of people, put them in a room together, strangers, and within two hours, I, I'll have them face to face with a stranger doing psychic readings for them. Marvelous. So how empowering, how empowering. And we can I, just I'm, do it by being aware. One thing I've noticed about us people is that yes. people begin to do this kind of thing, they tend to marginalize thoughts that come in that seem just too weird yes and it's a really good idea not to do that but just to receive what comes into your field of information without pushing something out oh no that couldn't possibly be right and another thing is is somebody's going to get a reading from another person don't tell them no don't give negative feedback because as soon as you start to give negative feedback it shuts down the creativity. Mm -hmm. I hear that. Yeah. So, so don't respond even. Um, just, just let them keep going. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking this could be fruitful for our listeners. Um, particularly Please. if it gets them, if it gets them thinking about how they've already experienced sensitivity. You know how they've already attuned or experienced psychic awareness. That's, that's, things that's, this stuff falls through the cracks for people a lot of times. Yes, uh, it, it's it's one of my purposes is is sharing that awareness, helping people become more aware like that. It's clear you are for what fifty eight years, I guess. Huh? I've been doing this for fifty eight years. Yeah, I'm seventy. Wow. I'll be seventy four in the summer. Mm -hmm. Now, one of my other concepts is uh, um, these ways of seeing things or behaviors. Um, what you and I do, um, the details are different, but the concepts are the same. And we're pretty much coming from the same place. The way we're doing what we're doing is different this is the details same energy same focus 
I'm sure that there's a heart, uh, a heart urge or a heart inspiration that's very similar here. Yes. So what would you like to say to the people? Because we're just about out of time. What would you like to say to the people about climate change and what each individual can do themselves? About what each individual can do themselves. I felt like I addressed that and wish that I could address it even better. And if I were with you, each one of you out there listening, I'd be asking you about what you're already doing that brings you into connection with the earth, what you care about the most in terms of the well-being of the earth, where you live. And I'd be wanting to draw out from you your resources, that, the strong points and the energies that you already have towards doing something. And then I might then feel like I could share specific specific organizations or approaches, but I think I'd be more interested in just seeing where your energy is. You know, there's a, there was a black theologian named Howard Thurman who said, don't ask what you can do to save the world. Ask what you can do that makes you come alive because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And so I'd wanna see what's alive in people already uh, that might help them to make some, not only to, to do something positive on a, on a a material level, but to allow themselves to feel that hope, which is a power, can exist side by side with sorrow and grief about what's happening in our climate and anxiety and fear, and that there can be room inside of us for all of this. In fact, there are a couple of really intense <laughs> songs I wrote in the book where I really tried to bring hope and my sorrow about the situation together. And I found that in so doing, uh, to the degree that I did do it, that something in me changed and opened more to an acceptance of the situation as it is while still having more energy to work for what I hope it can be. Um, I hope this is not too abstract. I think Because I sure it. don't want it to be, yeah. It uh, sounded exactly what people want to hear. I hope so. And I'm it sure has, if people were talking that to me, I'd be listening to you. <laughs> if um, I, I, I am so grateful that you've uh, joined me on my side of the crystal wall. It's, it's been fun. And uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I see the crystal ball and I think I see an arrowhead, but I'm not sure. Um, oh yeah, that's a, that that's a friend of mine sent this to me from um, uh, New Zealand. Uh, they oh, found it in the water. It's a heart-shaped stone. Depending on Golly, the I love it. So beautiful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What a deeply enlightening, uh, mind-expanding, and thought-provoking conversation we had tonight. Jeff Osner, what a fascinating story. What amazing ideas and concepts. Thank you so much. And by the way, everyone, um, Jeff has uh, uh, kindly offered um, a free copy of his latest book, Attunements for the Earth, poetic, musical, photographic, and acetylclinactic. Uh, natural, scientific, and spiritual. And all you need to do is just get the information just down at the bottom of the page. Before I end our, our, our show tonight, um, I've got a couple of questions. I have a couple of uh, uh, requests. If you're watching us on, on uh, YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It's so important that you subscribe uh, to our channel. When you do, it gives us more recognition, more recognition get, gets us uh, uh, more, more viewers, more viewers gets us a wider audience uh, and the opportunity to bring more episodes of My Side of the Crystal Ball. Please like 
once again, that information, that energy just gives us a little bit more charge and uh, comment. Comment and uh, tell us what you like, how you feel. And uh, if you comment, I'll comment right back to you. If you would like to find us on uh, around us uh, on you can you can find us on Apple, Spotify, uh, YouTube, I iHeart, uh, UK Paranormal, and pretty much anywhere else you find your podcast. If you are looking for me personally, you can find me on my website www.robertlindsaymilne.com. You can also find me on face facebook instagram uh youtube tiktok and uh pretty much anywhere else uh, uh, other medias that you would have um and now uh just before i say goodbye tonight i have some words to say do good stay safe and above all just be kind good night everybody Let's go.